This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. The legal information presented on In Legal Terms is meant to provide general information about the topics discussed and is not necessarily the opinion of Mississippi Public Broadcasting. The information conveyed does not create any type of attorney-client relationship. Please consult an attorney provider before making any decisions about your specific legal questions. Welcome to In Legal Terms from MPB Think Radio, the show all about you and your rights. Our host is Professor Richard Gershon of the University of Mississippi School of Law. I'm Liz Gill. Hello, Professor Gershon. Good morning, Liz. And, uh, you know, our guest today is a guest that we're always excited to welcome back, Professor Ron Rieschlock. Um, and, uh, you know, if I gave all of Ron's credentials, we really, I, I, I kid around about having to bump Susan Buttress, Dr. Buttress, from her show. If I gave all his credentials, we'd be here long enough that we'd have to bump her. Uh, he is, so I'll give just his, you know, the first three titles, which is, he's a distinguished professor of law, which is the highest um, title, uh, academic title that the university bestows. Very few people have it. The Jamie L. Witten Chair of Law and Government at the law school, and he's a faculty athletics representative, um, among many other things. So, um, but Ron, you teach and write about evidence and criminal law, among other things that you write about as well. Um, welcome back to the show. And, and how did you become interested in evidence and criminal law issues? Well, thank you, Richard. And uh, you know, I. I I, uh, it's always a joy to be on here with you and Liz, and uh, uh, I like the show so much. Even when I'm not on it, I listen. So uh, uh, I uh, appreciate that. Evidence, criminal law, criminal procedure. I, I grew up, I think, uh, you know, Perry Mason was on TV when I was a little kid, and my mom says uh, I've always wanted to be a lawyer since I was a little kid. And uh, I think courtroom evidence is one of the most fascinating areas of law there is it's very much trying to get from point a to point b logically and, and and discover the truth when i was in law school michael goldsmith was my evidence pro uh, professor he invited me to work on a textbook i in fact still use now it's the seventh edition of the textbook that i worked on as a research assistant when i was in law school uh, and criminal procedure i mean it, it's it's search warrants and it's it's uh um uh, Miranda or arrests it's what's on TV it's it's where the the most interesting area of law is I mean after your area of you know income tax thank you for saying that of course you know we always know that tax will be the most interesting but um, no and you know you today we're really going to be talking about that that interesting area of, of how where evidence and arrest come together uh, you know and how the Fourth Amendment treats those but let's talk about some basic evidentiary definitions if we can first and because uh, a lot of people hear about them but they don't know what they mean so for example what is what is hearsay exactly all right so hearsay uh is uh, obviously if you, your people are aware that it's something that people you know lawyers object to it's not admissible when someone testifies about it hearsay is defined as an out-of-court statement offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted so if i'm in court and i'm on the stand and you're trying you're my attorney and we're trying to con convince liz convince the J judge liz that uh um our, our colleague uh, Will Berry uh, uh, stole something from from the law school, and I test. You ask me, and I testify. Well, the dean told me Will Berry stole that thing from the law school. That's me not really knowing. I didn't see Will Berry steal it. I didn't. I, I have no firsthand evidence. Somebody told me, and I'm relaying a story. So if you're trying to to get to the truth, I'm, I'm not a very good person. I, I can't you can cross examine me, and all I can say is, well, somebody told me this. I can't, you know, the dean told me this. But you you need to have the person who saw the evidence firsthand there, so that that person can can relay what he or she saw, and uh, and 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 and. and and really get to the heart of the matter, get to a witness. Uh, really, hearsay is someone testifying who is not a witness. They've just got secondhand information. 
you got the wrong person on the stand, basically, right. is really what it comes down to. It's so interesting because I think one of the things that we do in the law is we make these, you know, these these magic words, almost almost the magic spells, it's, you know, an, an out of court statement made in court to you know assert the truth. What we're really saying is you got the wrong person on the stand, and that you know, and it, um, and I think that that makes it very clear for people. Thank you for that. Um, so when a witness is um, is you know on the stand, and you talked about cross examination. You hear people uh, object to leading questions on TV shows and things like that. What what exactly is that? And is a leading question ever a proper question? Well, yeah, surprisingly, leading questions are completely appropriate on cross-examination when the other attorney. So if I'm the witness on the stand and you're my attorney, you have to ask me what happened without asking leading questions. So you'll say, well, Ron, you know, what did, did, what if anything did you see next? Did anything happen next? Did you, you have to ask me questions to allow me to testify. It's both a, a legal requirement. It's also more persuasive. You're getting the testimony from the witness who saw the events take place and, and perceived the, 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 the stuff. Uh, you can't be saying, and isn't it true then that the car was going 40 miles an hour? And isn't it true then that the other car ran through the red light? If you are suggesting answers to me, uh, that's called leading. So in, in a way, the attorney is actually testifying at, at that point in time, and the witness is simply conf confirming. And that's inappropriate when we're making our case, when we're I'm on direct testimony the attorney would, would, would you know it's direct examination now on the other hand on the other side after i've testified the uh, opposing counsel gets up to cross-examine me opposing counsel can lead all he or she wants to uh and can say well you know isn't it true that you saw this thing uh and because they're trying to put me into a corner they're testing my knowledge testing whether i really perceive things appropriately whether i'm communicating them appropriately whether i might have made a misunderstanding forgot something uh they'll, they'll test me on all of those matters and to test me and to test not only my, my truthfulness but my memory uh they're allowed to have uh, leading questions that kind of put a scenario in play that I have to affirm or deny. A lot of times they'll say it's a yes or no question. And on cross-examination, you ask yes or no questions. On direct, you don't. We are speaking this morning about searches and seizures. We're getting making our way into that, learning a little bit of the basis. We'd love for you to be part of our show by sending us an email, legalterms at mpbonline.org. So let's jump in. Let's talk about the, the Fourth Amendment. How does it have an impact on the issue of evidence? Well, the, 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 the entire Bill of Rights, I think it's fascinating to really study the, the, the history of the Bill of Rights. It's uh, colonial times. The British are, are doing all kinds of things. They're controlling what you say. They're controlling where you go to church. They're controlling the press. They, they're taking away guns, they're putting soldiers in our homes, and they're going into houses and they're looking for tax. There wasn't an income tax. So when you had commerce, you had to put a stamp on your product to show you'd paid sales tax on it, basically. And uh, the colonists hated this. People were, you know, warrants were issued to go into every house on, on these three blocks and, and look and see if they've all paid their, 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 their taxes on their products. Uh, and so when we've overthrown the British and we're creating a new central government, uh, the, the, the colonists demanded a Bill of Rights, a restriction on the federal government that said this new entity we're creating isn't going to be a brand new King George that's going to do the same kind of stuff that the British did. So we want restrictions on them. And one of the first most important ones is we don't want police officers coming into our homes uh, unless at least there is a, 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 a prior judicial authorization, I, I call it in class a permission slip from a judge, to go in to a house. And, and that can only be issued if you've established that there's a pretty good chance that this thing we're looking, you can't just go in and look blindly. As, as, as Are there tax stamps on everything? It has to be probable cause to believe we're going to find a particular item in this particular space, we're not going to go into three blocks. You, you can identify my apartment, and you're looking for a specific thing in my apartment, and you go to a judge in advance, and you get that warrant, and that's what allows the officers to come to my house, uh, 
usually knock and announce at my house um, and, and then come in and look for that specific thing. So it's, uh, I mean, I think there, there's interesting history, but there's history in law, and, and I think it's a really uh, a fun area of law to study. History and current events. Precisely. You can send us an email if you have a question for our show. The address is legalterms at mpbonline.org. We're discussing the Fourth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, dealing with searches and seizures. You're listening to In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio. South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB public media app. This is In Legal Terms. Not everyone has a chance to listen to our show live. You've missed any of our program. You can listen to the whole show on the website, inlegalterms.mpbonline.org. Our host is Professor Richard Gershon from the University of Mississippi School of Law. I'm Liz Gill. This morning, we're talking about searching and seizures with our guest, Professor Ron Rieschlock. We had a caller who couldn't stay on the line, and right off the bat, uh, she wanted to know what would justify a no-knock warrant. We happened to talk about that this morning in my, in my criminal procedure class already, uh, no-knock warrants. A no-knock, okay, so a normal search warrant, a police officer has gone to a judge and said, we have reason to believe that this thing or this person will be at this location and we want to uh, execute the search or maybe make the arrest. And the judge will give a warrant that allows you to to first knock, wait about 20 seconds for them to answer the door. If they don't answer the door, then you can kick the door open. A no-knock warrant eliminates that 20-second wait period. So basically, officers can, with a warrant could just burst in immediately and, and, and make an arrest, make a seizure, do a search, whatever it is the warrant uh, authorizes. Um, in order to get a warrant like that, there's a higher showing that's necessary, usually that the people inside uh, pose a threat, that they may that tw- take that 20 seconds to get weapons, or they may take that 20 seconds to destroy evidence, flush drugs down the toilet or something like that. So uh, that is the traditional justification for a no-knock warrant. It does require a higher showing. After the Breonna Taylor case in Kentucky a couple years ago, where officers um, had a no-knock warrant, apparently when you look at it, they actually did knock and announce, but the Brianna's boyfriend fired from inside and they fired back, they killed her. Uh, and many jurisdictions, um, the, they're, they're in Louisiana where this took place, but there are other, other jurisdictions around the nation too, have done away with no-knock warrants. Now I'll say I've talked to uh, some uh, 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 prosecutors, uh, uh, federal prosecutors, who say they, they'd be afraid not to get no-knock warrants for agents when they send them in the field. That they think it, that they're putting their agents at risk if they go to some places okay. uh, uh, having to knock and announce. So it's it, it's a tough I'll, thing. I'll, I'll, I'll a All right, we've got a number of calls. Let's first go to Vicksburg and talk with Greg. Greg, thanks for calling in to In Legal Terms today. What's your comment or question? Yes, I will ask a question. Um, I was going to find out, um, like on a game warden, uh, do you know, from my understanding, they don't have to have a warrant at all to come into your house. Is that true? A game warden, Professor right. Schlott. 
Uh, you know, I mean, I think to come into your house, they they should have to. I, I honestly haven't looked that one up. I, I you know, if you, if you email me or something, I'll be happy to look that up because I mean, that raises, if that's true, that that that's unusual from any other thing I know. Of. Now they don't need a warrant to look in your car. They don't need a okay. warrant to come up and ask you to show you their, your, their license or to look at the tag on your deer zone like that. Yeah, but I, I don't I'm I didn't know it's true or not. They can come in your house. Okay, I just I didn't know it was true or not. I'm friends with the game warden. He was telling me about you know they have they my game warden has a little more power than a you know cop or whatever. You know, about they can enter your house without a warrant. That's, I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> well, Greg, we want your friend to be well informed. If you send us an email, Greg, our address is legal terms at mpbonline.org. That's why we absolutely love our guests. They'll go the, the extra mile, and if they can't answer something on the phone, a lot of times they'll take a little bit of extra time to research that. So we appreciate you calling in, Greg. Once again, our email address is legal terms at mpbonline.org. Let's go up to Herman- Hernando and talk with Mike. Mike, we're glad you've called in, too, in legal terms today. What's your comment or question? Uh, uh, professor, uh, l- let me uh, explain why I'm asking this question. <clears throat> I was a courtroom sketch artist for CBS News at the Ted Bundy trial in Salt Lake City. And at the time, uh, Judge Hanson allowed, of course, legally had to allow Ted to defend himself, and his arrogance was a little much. And post, practically everybody that was following the story and knew what had been going on uh, was shaking their heads like, geez, he's guilty, let's get it over with. But what is the precedence for allowing an individual to represent themselves? Now, he did have a state-appointed lawyer sitting next to him, but the man never opened his mouth. Uh, t- uh, Ted said, you know, I'll handle it. And it was disturbing and I know you see that occasionally and people are always wondering well what's what's the law yeah well, well Mike number one that's a great question number two gee I'd love to have you come to law school sometime and and, and talk about this because uh, you've obviously seen so that case but probably some other cases that are fascinating too yeah. uh, in terms yeah, absolutely. It, it, I mean frankly the Constitution <laughs> provides that you have a right to represent yourself now if you yeah don't and, and and Ted had a year of law school and and he was very arrogant. He actually used that later on to get married, to get married in prison when they yeah. would not allow him. He actually figured out a way and managed to, to have a, a, a yes, prison wedding. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. Basically, trick people in, in, into to get let him get married when they didn't know that's what they were doing. Uh, but uh, you, you do have that right unless it gets to the point where you interfere with the proceedings of the court, which technically is contempt of court. And if that's the situation, then that's why the judge had the, the support counsel available there. It was the, he, the, ju- the, the judge would have at some point, if it became necessary, instructed that, that advisory counsel to take over if the guy got in the way. Uh, but if Ted Bundy, even if he's being a lousy attorney, you have a right to be a lousy attorney. And I've seen, and, and you know, there's an old saying: a, a, an attorney who represents himself has a fool for a client. Uh, and, and I've seen that more than once uh, in my career. In fact, uh, I stepped away from representing myself recently when I realized I was being a fool. Uh, but. Uh, he, you you, well, uh, uh, you you do have that right, so you don't have to get an attorney. And really, our system should be set up so that people could represent themselves better, probably than they do. I sometimes wonder, wouldn't it be better if we had a situation where uh, people could represent themselves? Uh, but uh, well, the reason it'd be a the very reason bad idea. You, the reason I asked you was during the course of the trial, Ted kept calling Judge Hanson uh, by his first name, Stewart. And we were cringing. We we're like, "You've got to be joking! You don't call a judge by his first name." And Judge Hanson let him get away with it for a while, and then he suddenly stopped him. He said, uh, "Mr. Bundy, let me stop you. I'll do you the courtesy of calling you Mr. Bundy. You, sir, will address me as Your Honor. Do you understand me?" And there was almost applause in the courtroom. You know. And did he did he do it from then on? Oh yeah, you should. Ted stiffened up and he said, "I'm I'm sorry, sir. Excuse me." And we were like, "Yes, finally, good boy." 
<laughs> if I can interject, Ron, sometimes don't, I mean, if you've got somebody who's doing pro se, so that means they're representing themselves, judges will give them a lot more latitude in general than someone who's represented by uh, counsel. We, we're expected to, to uphold certain standards, but pro se litigants sometimes get that latitude. Thanks, Mike. We, uh, you know, once again, uh, send us an email, Mike. Uh, your Our email address is legalterms at mpbonline.org. Or uh, our guests are not uh, invisible. <laughs> if you just Google Professor Ron Rischlack, R-Y-C-H-L-A-K, you're going to find his contact information and his illustrious list of distinguished uh, titles on the internet. So, Mike, we appreciate you calling in with your question. We're talking about the Fourth Amendment and search and seizures. Let's now go to Tupelo and talk with Bradley. Bradley, thanks for calling in to In Legal Terms today. What's your comment or question? Oh, good morning. Um, I'm wondering what the Fourth Amendment implications are of these roadblocks that are put up around. Uh, you know, Northeast Mississippi, where they check every car or stop every car that comes by. Without, yeah, no, uh, that's a great question. This was litigated uh, heavily about 25 years ago or so. There were a number of cases that hit the Supreme Court. These are deemed to be regulatory searches, not investigatory searches. And you can you can question that all you want, but a regulatory search is designed, for instance, in that case, uh, for the safety of the road, to make sure that everyone is properly licensed and not impaired in any way. And the fundamental rule is that it has to either get everybody or get every fifth car or every second car. They cannot do it as a... Uh, this one looks suspicious, that one doesn't, and let some go through. Uh, the uh, Supreme Court has, has held for regulatory purposes, which are not, it's not based upon on probable cause. It's, there's no warrant because there is no cause. It, it's a regulatory thing. It's like a fire warrant, a, a fire chief going into a, an apartment complex and making sure that you've got the fire alarms and, and whatever you need. That's the constitutional justification anyway. Okay, um, so it sounds to me like a police officer individually could just stop every third car that he or she comes, you know, in contact with, like sitting in a parking lot, and every third car just stop that one. I, I mean, I, I think these have been upheld constitutionally because they have been a departmental program put in place. Uh, and there have been some, actually, that, that have uh, uh, had run into constitutional problems because if, they, if there's causes a, a significant burden on the flow of traffic and on people, there have actually been a case out of Wisconsin that, that uh, uh, created, and Wisconsin or Michigan, uh, created a problem uh, with that. Uh, but in, uh, and so I'm not sure an, an individual officer could do that. I mean, uh, that, because I don't think an individual officer can do the sort of regulatory thing that a, a formal roadblock uh, can do. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bradley. We appreciate you calling in. Now we're going to move to the capital city of Jackson and talk with Jim. Jim, thanks for calling in to In Legal Terms today. What's your comment or question for our guest, Professor Ron Rischleck? Good morning. Um, I, I missed the first few minutes of the show, and so if this issue has already been addressed, please stop me and let me know. Um, I have heard anecdotal stories about people having their cell phones searched at ports of entry, even U.S. citizens, um, without a warrant. What's the justification for that? Well, the... Uh the, the, the search of cell phones has been a, a matter of recent uh, of review by the Supreme Court. Uh, once upon a time, you could search, and you know, when someone's coming in or you search someone because they've been arrested uh, or uh, anything like that, you, you could search really the entire person. Uh, there's a, a 19, or excuse me, a, a, a 2018 Supreme Court case, Carpenter versus United States, where that issue was argued. And, uh, and 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 really, I went to a, a panel discussion of the year or two before it was decided, and there was a big discussion as to whether 
for instance, if you're arrested or you're, you're in custody in some way, we can search your entire body. Can we also search your phone? Uh, and uh, a lot of people thought you could because that followed along with the, the argument of, of, of how we'd approach things up till then. But the court ultimately said, you know, a phone is uniquely personal. There, you've got so much stuff now. All of your reading habits, your viewing habits, your photographs, your, your communications, uh, all that information so that, uh, and, 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 and we can even use it to establish where you were at a given time so the court uh, imposed higher standards, uh, so really just, four, we're talking three, four years ago, uh, to make it clear that you do need a warrant to get the information from a phone. That wouldn't have been necessarily the way they approached it five years ago, though. Well, that's great. Um, and by the way, I understand that you continue to be, I hope, uh, on the athletics committee, and we are all ready for some Rebel baseball. I'm ready. I'm ready myself. And uh, uh, Tim Elko is back 100%. I saw the other day. So, uh, and uh, I don't know if you saw the uh, the uh, uh, new guy, the offensive lineman who uh, yeah, I saw oh, yeah. on Facebook. He, he he jacked one out the other day. <laughs> that guy's really good. <laughs> He's huge. And, and and baseball's a lot of fun. I encourage everybody to get your season tickets. We've expanded, we've opened some new places. So yeah, I still got the position. <laughs> well said, well said, Professor. <laughs> you can email us your questions. Our address is legalterms at mpbonline.org. We're talking with Professor Ron Rishlock about search and seizures. What do you think? What do you know? Folks, you need to listen because this is stuff that you do need to know. You're listening to In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio. Charlie Melton, and I want to help steer you in the right direction. If you need coaching on fixing up your automobile, listen to our podcast, Auto Correct, found on all podcasts and platforms. Hanging on to a vehicle you can't drive feels like a dream where you try to run but can't. Rather than hit the snooze for another year, why not donate your car, truck, or other vehicle to MPB and wake up to great television and radio? Call 877-MPB-4-CAR or go to mpbonline.org slash support and click on Donate a Vehicle to support the programs you count on morning and evening. Now that's a good dream. You're listening to In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio. Professor Richard Gershon is our expert host. I'm Liz Gill. We do hope you'll subscribe to our podcast, or you can just find MPB Think Radio recordings at mpbonline.org slash radio. This morning, we're talking about search and seizures with our guest, Professor Ron Rishlock. We've had some fantastic phone calls. There are more coming in, but while we're waiting for that, let's let's uh, get back to learning a little bit more information. What uh, about talk about search and seizures inside of a home without a warrant? How tell us more about that, Professor Rishlock? All right. Well, you know, the the starting assumption is to enter a home, uh, there has to be a warrant. If there's not one, presumably it's uh, an unreasonable search and seizure. And and the, the remedy for an unreasonable seizure is that any evidence that's found is excluded. You can't use it in a subsequent trial. So if we go into a house without a warrant and there's not an exception, I'll talk about some exceptions in a minute, but but if we don't have a warrant and there's not an exception and we recover, you know, the, the bloody glove or the, the dead body or the or the million dollars stolen from the bank, 
that evidence can't be used because we have violated the Fourth Amendment rights of the uh, defendant suspect when we went into the house without the warrant. There are some exceptions. Uh, exception number one would be an exigent circumstance. So uh, I'm an officer, I hear a scream from inside a house, or I see a, a fire that seems to be ablaze, or I, someone's yelling for help, or I'm chasing a suspect from a, from a violent crime and they run into a house and I follow them in. These are exigent circumstances, emergency situations that authorize the officer to go in. Uh, so the officer's in for a legitimate reason. Anything that is then in plain view uh, could be seized and could be used at trial. Another one, one that's, that's fairly common for a lot of searches, is a consent search. An officer says, would you mind if I come in and look around a little bit? And uh, you can either say, no, go get a warrant, which if they have probable cause, they, they, they could do. But if they, uh, or, or, or your answer can be, sure, come on and look around. They'll do this a lot with, with cars, by the way, or, or baggage. You don't mind if I look in your purse, do you? Uh, and uh, if you give consent, you can't object later. That, that's called a consent search. So uh, the, the officers know that there's sort of pressure, I think, on people to consent. Uh, and there is, and you feel that. It, it, it's hard to uh, resist someone saying, you don't mind if I, I look around. Because if, if you say, I, I do mind, you feel like you're incriminating yourself. So you, so you don't want to do that. So uh, an exigent circumstance, a, a consent search, um, things like that. There are, are a few exceptions. But the general rule is requires a warrant and the uh, failure to uh, abide by a warrant or one of the recognized exceptions results in the evidence being suppressed at the trial. Well, All right. It's so, it's, it's so interesting. Uh, you know, this is, uh, when you talk about this, you said that if I, if the police search my place without a warrant and um, so that, then the evidence is suppressed because of my Fourth Amendment rights. And I know a lot of people would say, well, why not just give the person a remedy under the Fourth Amendment and still allow that evidence in? Uh, why have we gone in that direction? Well, you know, I mean, there are arguments like that. Uh, I've been I've been to a couple of, uh, of uh, sem seminars where that's been debated. Uh, I think that the, the primary conclusion is there is no other disincentive that is as effective in dissuading police from violating Fourth Amendment rights or dissuading authorities, I should say, um, than the exclusionary rule. Now, there, there, are, there are some funny little hiccups in that rule, Richard. If I'm storing uh, uh, the loot at your house and the police burst into your house without a warrant, they find the loot and, and they're prosecuting me, uh, my Fourth Amendment rights were not violated, uh, I cannot have it suppressed. And if you were an innocent person, suppose I, I hid the loot in your closet, you didn't know about it. Your Fourth Amendment rights were violated, but the, uh, the, for, the, the exclusionary rule doesn't really give you any benefit because you're not going to be prosecuted anyway. So there are problems with the exclusionary rule. Uh, and a lot of people have played with, I, I, I was in a seminar, I think I wrote a paper once arguing uh, for a different kind of, because we were asked, they said, you know, what are some other remedies that could come up? And uh, uh, we, we, we tried, but I, I think that the consensus in general is it's really hard to protect the Fourth Amendment with other means uh, than the exclusionary rule. Well, I could sit and listen to Professor Ron Rishlock talk about this all day. You are better than Perry Mason, although we did just finish binge-watching Reacher, and that was really good. And he spouts off uh, lots of uh, legal r uh, rules, and gosh, I hope it's all correct because uh, it, it's really clever and smart. So I, I recommend Reacher, and when it is gross, you, you know not to watch if it gets too PG-13. Anyway, let's, uh, we're, we could listen to Ron Richlock talk all day, but we also want to take your calls like Mike in Meridian. Mike, we're glad that you've called in to In Legal Terms today. What's your comment or question? Hi. Uh, maybe a follow-up question on the cell phone search. I think the caller prefaced that with at the border. 
uh, coming back into the country. So uh, maybe the broader question is, what sort of protections do you have as a U.S. citizen before you're back into the country? And I don't well, know that, if that's that, in your purview or not, it, it, it's specifically to search and seizure, but just in general terms. Well, I, I, mean, I will say uh, your Fourth Amendment rights at the border are not as strong as they are in the heart of the country. Uh, the border allows for much greater intrusion, things that would be uh, uh, clearly in violation of the Fourth Amendment if they took place uh, at a place other than the border. I mean, they wouldn't be able to look through your baggage. They wouldn't be able to uh, have you go through uh, various, uh, you know, the, the checkpoints that we have coming in, in into the country where they, they have dogs sniff all around and they do everything and they, they, they look with mirrors under your under your vehicle that there are things there are there's a different set of rules at the border and that's been debated as well whether that's fair whether that's right but uh, we're clearly trying to insulate the uh, the nation as much as we can from from uh, criminal types from diseases from drugs from uh, weapons that are you know unknown unlicensed unknown uh, unauthorized uh, all those kind of things so the, the rights at the border, and, and you're, you're right earlier when he mentioned at the border, I, I didn't really focus on that when I was talking about the cell phones, but the, uh, uh, the, the, the invasion, if you will, of your, your personal uh, property and, and, and your person itself is much greater at the border than it is uh, in the center of the country. Mike, anything else? No, I just want to clarify that for anybody else listening that uh, across the border frequently and um, have always been under that same impression that you you have a lot less protection until you're actually back in the country. So thank you for clarifying it. Thank you, Mike. We appreciate you calling in. Now let's go to the coast and talk with Chuck in Biloxi. Chuck, thanks for calling in to In Legal Terms today. What's your comment or question? Hi, Professor. I have a really good question for you. Let me give you the scenario. I signed into a community center that I had been a member of and was asked to sign a rights waiver that included any and all rights. I crossed that out and I signed it, acquiescence estoppel by, and they called the police and when the police came, being a bright guy and listening to your show a lot, I cited the full verse of the First Amendment, free exercise, freedom of speech to government grievance, and I cited the full 14th, due process and equal protection, and they recorded that, and then they arrested me, and I spent four and a half months in a detention center. Can you comment on the Fourth Amendment, hinged in Thanks for calling. the you know, question or comment today. So, you comment on Chuck. We're we're losing you a little bit. Can you? What do you? What did you want him to comment about? If you can comment on the Fourth Amendment, hinged in my citing of the First and the Fourteenth Amendment for illegal search and seizure and, and false imprisonment and malicious prosecution. Well, maybe you could just uh, pick one of them. That seems like a, a, a quite a lot of comments, but Professor Rischlock, what uh, d what do you have to say? Well, you know, I, I think, Chuck, I, I think you've got a, an individual case. So you're kind of asking for sort of legal advice on a uh, on a specific matter, and it sounds very detailed with a lot of issues. And I think you really need to get an attorney. You know, we can talk about general legal principles, uh, but we can't really give legal advice. And and uh, so I think I think we probably need to step away from this, Richard. Isn't that right? I think so. And you know, one thing I think it's important to understand is this is a one-hour show. We don't even really have one-hour content. You te in your criminal procedure class, you spend 14 weeks on, on issues like this with law students, and even then, you're really just touching the tip of the iceberg on a lot of these things. So they really are pretty nuanced, and, and we can't give specific advice. Well, let's so, uh, go ahead. I was talking to some of my students the other day and, and just saying, 
you know, you think that every situation has come up before and you should be able to look it up in a book somewhere. You're continually amazed that the situation you're looking at is new and unique and re requires re research uh, to understand. Well, let's stay on the coast and get to Eric real quick before we go to break. Eric, thanks for calling in to In Legal Terms today. What's your comment or question? Hi, good morning. I know it's off subject, but it has to do with laws in Mississippi. I'm a expatriate from New York, and what drives me crazy is people down here on the coast don't drive with their headlights on. And is there a law in Mississippi covering headlight usage? Well, my understanding is when it rains, you have to have your lights on. That That's one. And I know a lot of states have that. Uh, as far as I, my car has running lights, so I know that they're on when I, as soon as I turn the engine on, even on a sunny day. Ron, do you know of any? Or? Yeah, no, uh, I don't know. I don't think it has to be on in daylight. I don't think they have to be on. But at night, I, I think at night, the, uh, an officer, I would assume, could pull you over. I think usually it's not on. In fact, I know I, I happen to know this because I had a daughter who got pulled over. Uh, or she let a friend drive her car and a friend didn't turn the lights on, didn't realize they didn't come automatically. And uh, uh, so so uh, it was the middle of the night went with my daughter. But I think the same is with if your wipers are on, your lights are supposed to be on. Uh, and um, so they can pull you over and I think they can ticket you um, if, if the conditions call for lights. Yeah, I was just curious. I don't want to inter I'm sorry, interrupt, but I keep my lights. As soon as my car starts, I turn my lights on night and day. It's uh, There was a study done several years ago that if your lights are on during the day, your car is 30 to 40 percent more visible than with the lights off. That is so for me, it's a I, safety know, thing. That's surprising. And I actually remember that study. I, I think you are. I think you are. I remember reading you are more visible uh, even in day with your lights on. It's true. But it's yeah. not a requirement of the law, though. Thanks, okay. Eric. I just, thank you very much for your time. All right, we're going to go real quick and take a break. But if you have any questions, we would love for you to email us, legalterms at mpbonline.org. We're learning today about searches and seizures with our guest, Professor Ron Rieschlock. This is In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio. Hi, I'm Ryder Taff, Portfolio Manager at New Perspectives, a fee-only financial advisory and co-host of Money Talks. Each week, we take your personal finance questions and tell you about a money topic we hope you find helpful. Money Talks can be heard Tuesdays at 9 a.m. on MPB Think Radio. Podcasts can be found on our website, money.mpbonline.org, or on your smart devices podcasting platform. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. Thank you for being part of In Legal Terms. If you've missed any of our program, you can listen to the whole show on MPB Think Radio's YouTube channel. It's also available on the MPB Public Media app, as are most of our local shows. Our host is Professor Richard Gershon from the University of Mississippi School of Law. I'm Liz Gill. And no matter how exciting, thrilling, and information-packed our show is, we cannot bump Dr. Susan Buttress at 11 a.m. Central. Following our over-the-air broadcast, it's Southern Remedy, Relatively Speaking, on MPB Think Radio. We're talking today with our guest, Professor Ron Rischlack from the University of Mississippi School of Law. Remember, you can always send us an email. Our address is legalterms.com 
at mpbonline.org. We did get an email, uh, Professor Rischlack. It was from an individual who is having a disagreement with a state agency, and she would like to try to collect evidence. They, She says one thing, and they're denying it. Is there a way for an individual to compel some kind of evidence from a state agency? Well, yeah, you know, the, uh, the there, there's a Freedom of Information Act uh, that allows you to uh, request information simply with a letter, frankly, to the right agency, any, any information they have on a particular topic. They may want you to limit it in some way, uh, cut things back, back a little bit or, or just give a time frame. But uh, I saw the email. The email, I thought, I think you could make a reasonable uh, letter to, to the agency. I also think in that email, there was a question about money being taken from a bank. The bank should have that information. In fact, I think that'd be my first approach would be to, if, if you think that money has been taken from a bank by a state agency, get that confirmed by the bank. Uh, and if the bank says yes, then I, I think you've got a pretty strong case right there. Professor Gershon, we've got uh, about five, four more minutes to get the rest of <laughs> to uh, pick well, Professor Rieschlock's brain. It has gone by quickly, and we appreciate Ron being here. But Ron, uh, let's let's talk about some kind of current things. We just passed uh, medical marijuana in uh, in Mississippi, and one of the evidentiary questions is uh, dog sniff. You know, they use dog sniffs for drugs. I mean, how is that possibly an incursion into someone's Fourth Amendment rights? Well, that, dog sniffs are very fascinating. I worked on a dog sniff case years ago with the uh, late Professor George Cochran, and um, so studied it a little bit. And really interesting thing. So, it, it, if I uh, am suspicious of a school locker or a package at an airport or whatever, I, I can't just open those things up without a warrant or without without, without a reason. It, it, if you're going into an area, we can condition you can't come in here unless we. we go through scanning but but in general i can't make you uh disclose something private to me uh however dog sniffs have been determined to be non-invasive a dog walking around a car walking around a locker room well, you know, doing whatever walking past packages uh, a dog doesn't reveal anything that's private a, a, a dog doesn't see stuff that you're trying to keep private dog can smell can be trained to to, to uh, smell drugs or narcotics or or, or explosives, um, uh, the different things that dogs are trained to detect, and they detect this without invading anyone's privacy. So a dog sniff, in almost all circumstances, there's one big exception, uh, is not deemed to be an, uh, a, a Fourth Amendment search, and so does, you don't need a warrant to have a dog sniff. In fact, what the dog does is the dog sniffs, the dog then indicates, often just by sitting down, and not really by barking like we all think. Uh, and uh, that then gives you probable cause to seek a warrant to look into the private place. The one exception, by the way, of this is the police officers, there was a case just a couple of years ago, walked a dog up to the door, front door of a house to get to have the dog sniff. Dog indicated they found drugs. Dog did what the dog was supposed to do. Um, the court said taking a, a sniffer dog to the front door of a house, even though the public can go to your front porch, you take a sniffer dog up there for the purpose of sniffing the house, that's too far, and they excluded that evidence. Now, the interesting thing you raise about medical marijuana in this state and so many other states is we've got these dogs that are trained to, to detect every all kinds of narcotics, you know, from heroin to, to, to meth to, to, to marijuana. Well, now they're going to be indicating on legal products, marijuana that's legal. That means they don't provide probable cause anymore. It means you can't get a warrant based upon their indication. That means a lot of these dogs are going to be out of work and looking for new homes. So uh, some of the places are being put up for adoption. That's so interesting and kind of sad. So, yeah, I'm glad we passed medical marijuana, but uh, didn't think about that that particular consequence. 
Um, you know what? Real quickly, I know we don't have much time. No, we don't have what? any time. Here comes our music all... right now. Oh, no. We we'll talk. We'll see if uh, prof- if uh, uh, Doctor Buttress wants to take a vacation one day, and we'll we'll see if we can take over her hour. But thank you, Professor Richlock. We are so glad that you are, were able to be on our show today. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Thank Richard. I appreciate it. That's going to wrap us up for today's In Legal Terms. Thank you to Java Chapman and to Jay White for helping me put on our show today. So for Professor Richard Gershon, who hosts from the University of Mississippi School of Law, I'm Liz Gill. Please join us next Tuesday at 10 a.m. Central for In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio.